Hey everyone, welcome to our event today. Happy Friday. We are here to discuss a feature that we're having in the chat area, a discussion of how do you even get access to this? We will talk about that, but uh, don't take it personal if you don't have access to it. Very, very few people do. But we wanted to show you something that is coming down the pike, is uh, really um, uh, a, a neat thing to understand some of the new capabilities that ChatGPT and some of its extensions are capable of. And this is straight down the wheelhouse, uh, straight down the middle of the sorts of things that OpenAI is working on. Um, so yeah, welcome to this event. Today, we're gonna talk about ChatGPT. Our focus is going to be on the code interpreter specifically, okay? The code interpreter, is something that is in alpha testing right now. But like our previous events, we're also gonna talk about some new things that have just been uh, in development over the last month. We're gonna do that kind of repeatedly. So if there is any development that happens, it's just good to chat about that. And we'll use these events as an opportunity to share what is, uh, uh, what, what are the changes? And some are gonna be relevant to you, some may not be. Uh, a little bit about myself, I am Dan Young. I'm one of the technical instructors over here at Stormwind. And we have actually quite a few people that are spending a lot of time on AI in our group. And I have one of them. And I have some people in the chat area supporting me, uh, people like Russ Long, uh, who is a, a virtualization expert. He's also deeply integrated into the world of AI and has focuses on OpenAI and, uh, and Google Bard. Okay, so what are the developments that we have today? What are we gonna do? Just so you understand what this is about, we'll really briefly share with some developments that have happened in OpenAI over the last few weeks. We meet basically once a month, at least. At least I'm running about an uh, event every month. We're gonna talk about the code interpreter and we're gonna demo the heck out of it. And we were talking even before this event and there's a lot of misinformation about it. If you do some Google research, you're gonna find that uh, there's a lot of weird information about it that isn't actually accurate. Um, just to catch people up, Last time when we met, we talked about AutoGPT, and I have been playing around with the new version of AutoGPT, and so I'll mention a little bit of the developments for that. But this week, there were some updates that are going to be impactful to anybody who works with the API. And I am one of the people who work with the API. We are leveraging, it's actually really, uh, uh, very, very cost effective and very powerful at the same time. So it's a, it's a great technology. And what's interesting about it is there were two updates that were made towards uh, the main uh, large language model choices that you can uh, execute with the API. And the biggest impact, I think, is the one for GPT 3.5. So in the world of the API, it's very, very easy to build a program. Like you can build a Python program that is gonna bring in the capability of ChatGPT into your program. And GPT 3.5 had some pretty big limitations. It wasn't steerable. It wasn't really steerable, as in if you gave it instructions, it would sometimes follow, sometimes wouldn't. Apparently, the new version of the GPT-3 model that came out in 0613, that's three days ago. So that is the numeric value for the model, but it also indicates the date of that change. If you are using the API, it would be good to test that out. The other thing that allows you to do is support 16,000 tokens. So it goes from 4K to 16K, which means you can consume four times the amount of information, which is wildly impactful. That's a really big space for the large language model to work in. And that could be really impactful to real world use cases. 
There's also something about function calling, and I'm not going to speak to that at all because the function calling capability is pretty new, and I've read the documentation, and I haven't played around with it, but it is kind of an interesting thing that will probably be really exciting. Um, just a little bit, if any of you are playing around with agents like Auto GPT or Baby AGI, uh, these, are, these are things where you can essentially build uh, build a virtualized a virtualized environment to run Python code to effectively let the GPT capable model run loose and you can give it some overall direction and you can have it work on files and uh, iterate over and over again. There was a new version of auto GPT that came out last week. I played around with it. And the TLDR, that, that TLDR at the top of the screen is literally straight pulled from GitHub. And it basically says, hey, users aren't going to see a big update. I saw a slight improvement, but some of the things that I've tried to push the envelope for for AutoGPT, I wasn't able to get it to the point where I was really satisfied. I kind of think now that AutoGPT is going to get a lot more baked in probably 0 0.5, 0 0.6. And uh, we're not seeing something that I think is uh, uh, is going to be really fruitful for you. Okay, so one of the most impactful things for news is a capability that uh, I didn't see any announcements for, but I think it's really cool. And yeah, so um, by the way, CyberMonkey is wondering, hey, why is that an octopus? That's the icon for significant gravitas who is the sort of the initial developer for AutoGPT. And that's some of the iconography for, uh, that's similar to the iconography for, um, for AutoGPT, yeah. By the way, one of the challenges that I always find with, with ChatGPT got solved. And that is sometimes I don't want all of my history to be revealed. OK, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, I'll, we've got a few questions that are going to come in. OK, so um, Chris says, wait, AutoGPT runs in a virtual Linux environment. Um, so basically, right now, the main way that you're going to run it is either in Azure or in a Docker container. And it and it's this baked environment that you can uh, that you can run inside of. Um, and when I say baked as in something that's going to produce consistent output, that it's going to be that's going to be predictable and going to be desirable. OK, a lot of times it's going to wind up um, uh, maybe missing the mark a little bit. OK, and so that's that's what I'd say. It's it's absolutely full in development. It's uh, it's something that's getting a lot of attention and there are a lot of people who are working on it. And the reason why I brought it up is, hey, that was the last thing we talked about. We talked about that in May, okay? Now, the cool thing is you can finally hide the sidebar. And, you know, I, I spend, you know, sometimes a few minutes in a day, sometimes more. And sometimes I don't want to see, uh, have people see the gory details of what I've worked on. And so the cool thing is you do now have the ability to hide the sidebar. It's a little thing. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner. So if you're like, hey, I want to show you ChatGPT, because you're if you're in this event, probably you know more than some of the people in your proximity, right? And so you're probably going to show them, hey, let me let me you know show you this thing that I did in ChatGPT. And sometimes it's good to hide the sidebar so you don't see things like, hey, you know, email addresses and uh, and the last things that you did, and you know, whatever. OK, so I think that's really cool that you can collapse the sidebar. OK, let's and yeah, we, we spent about nine minutes kind of warming ourselves up. Today, we're going to talk about the code interpreter. And I saw one person in the audience. There are about uh, there's uh, about 52 people that have provided a name uh, to themselves right now, fully logged in. So. A lot of you probably are plus subscribers. OK, so that would be one of the first things that you'd need in order to be capable of getting access to the newest fun stuff. OK, 
So there's a lot of exciting developments in the world of OpenAI that don't hit people that aren't subscribers. Okay, it's $20 a month. And so recently they pretty much rolled out the plugins capability and browsing with Bing capability to every one of the plus subscribers as well as GPT-4. The thing we're gonna talk about today is not widely available. There are only a few people in my sphere that have access to this, okay? And so what I'm gonna show you is how it works when you do get access, or if you know somebody who has access, this is very powerful. And one of the things that's interesting about it is it isn't for programmers, okay? It's just for regular knowledge professionals, okay? So I'm a knowledge professional, as in the, the things that I can execute with my brain are mostly the expression of what I bring to the table for whatever organization that I work for, right? So, um, so, and that if you're thinking, okay, so, um, I uh, am I a knowledge professional, right? Do you produce more output the more knowledgeable you are? Are you more effective at your job the more knowledgeable you are? So, this is something that's really uh, interesting for any knowledge professional, and it is an agent, okay? It is an agent which means you can ask it to do something and it will iterate for you. So if you happen to be in the presentation, the event that I ran on AutoGPT, this is something that is slightly more baked as in, I'm gonna run into problems today. I know it. I'm just gonna work through those problems or pivot a punt if I need to, okay? Why is it called the code interpreter is the first question that I had. And I'm like, I woke up one Saturday morning and I'm hitting chat GBT. I see it in the drop down menu and I'm like, what the heck is this? I've never even heard of this before. And this was a few weeks ago, like three, four weeks ago. Okay. It's called code interpreter because it is capable of building a Python program on the fly to do something for you. Okay, now you might think, well, wait a minute, I'm not a Python programmer, so this isn't applicable to me. The, the reality is it is applicable to you, especially if you don't know Python, okay? Because it's gonna do the Python coding for you. That's its main purpose, main mission in life, is to take your input and build a Python program that is going to do the sorts of things that you're asking it to do. Now, it isn't capable of everything, okay? But we're going to demonstrate some capabilities today that are, are pretty powerful and speak to the, the promise of things like this and whatever else is cooking in the laboratories for OpenAI. What's really cool about this capability is it does allow you to upload your files, okay? Now, in March... When GPT-4 came out, OpenAI AI demonstrated that you were going to be able to upload your images and it was going to be able to interpret those images, okay? Now, I don't have access to that capability. It's still a really narrow set of people who have access to it. But it's kind of like a weird thing. We're not used to uploading our files, but we can upload our files and we can ask it to manipulate those files, okay? so. Uh, or even create new files for us. We could theoretically create a new data set, okay? And then you can download an updated version of your file, okay? So we're gonna launch some files over to the code interpreter. We're gonna ask it to do some things and then we're gonna get it back in return. Uh, so we got the question, is it capable of setting up a Python environment on your desktop? No. So it is running probably in a container on their side. Okay. Um, it will tell you, by the way, the Python code that is running. So if you have an IDE, which is a development environment for Python, you would be able to take that, 
see what the code interpreter did and build that into your environment. So you would be able to port it, but it's going to be a manual process, OK? So here are some of the demonstrations that we're going to do today. We're going to work at the data set. We're going to look at some security logs. We're going to work with an image file. And we may work with a video file. There's a size limitation. There's a size limitation with, uh, with the code interpreter. It will allow you to send up to 100 meg file. OK, 100 meg file. You're uploading it, though. And my experience is don't push the envelope because it's going it, to some of the files that I'm going to send are they're going to they're going to bork on me. I expect to have to battle some of the uploads that I have. And if it works seamlessly, then the stars have aligned. That's great. OK. Let's go out to the environment. We spent enough time kind of sharing a little bit. And let's go here. And let's get in. By the way, if you are reading about the code interpreter, <laughs> don't believe what you read. Uh, don't believe what you read. And actually, let's begin there, OK? So I'm going to use the Browse with Bing. What is the chat GPT code interpreter? I'm going to let that run loose. And I'm also going to fire up Google Bard. I'm not a big user of Google Bard just because I've gotten so heavily invested um, in open AI technology. And there's still a lot more for me to learn. But this is one of the times when Bard, I actually think, is going to do a better job. What is the chat GPT code interpreter. And if you have a preference, chat in. Do you like Bard more? Do you like chat GPT more? There are people that have a preference. By the way, Bard is just way fast. It's crazy, OK? So it says some things about chat GPT. Still under development. It can run clean Python code, upload and download files generate data visualization. So yeah, it can create graphs for you. This is sometimes really empowering, right? Your boss, or you might have an urge to, to do something, and you're like, I got I to gotta process and analyze this data. It is capable of data analytics. And so there's a whole disciplines for knowledge professionals, data scientists. That's a that's a very important emerging uh, emerging discipline and field. And I say emerging, it's been out for over a decade, right? But data scientists wasn't really a thing 50 years ago, at least not in the way that's manifested now. But if you had to do some analytics on a file, and let's say you're not good at Power BI or Tableau, well, you could jump in here and give it a whirl. You might have better tools, but it's nice to be able to use this sort of thing, OK? Yeah, some people, Blaine says, I like Bard more. OK, cool. <laughs> and ChatGPT, one of the users in chat, definitely. That's, that's good. I, I'm glad that ChatGPT likes me better, OK? So let's go back to chat GPT for a moment. And now we're going to go into the code interpreter. OK, now the first demonstration I'm going to do is not going to be working with moving files. I just want you to get a chance. OK, so what I did, OK, I did it kind of fast, so I got to slow myself down. I went up to GPT-4, and you don't have access to this, even this tab, if you're not a Plus subscriber, OK? And then you go down to Code Interpreter, which you can see has the designation of Alpha. Previously, the Browse with Bing and plugins were in Alpha. OK, so I actually expect more things to, to come down the pike from ChatGPT. So the first thing is, let's say we're, we're just trying to uh, explore that capability of writing Python code. Build me a Python program to translate 
uh, binary to decimal, the first value to translate is, there you go. And I'll say zero B, let's see if it takes that. The way that people uh, represent the, the numbering system is with zero B. So I'll send that. So what I'm hoping it's going to do is it's going to pick up on my direction and So it created some Python code, but I didn't really kick off the code interpreter. It says, would you like me to run this code? Okay, would you like me to run this code? Yes, please do. So now it kicked off the code interpreter. So I'm gonna hit show work and you would be able to take this code, you can just hit the copy code button, plug that in to a development environment, and that would be sample code. What's cool about this is, let's say you're a novice coder, you don't know how to do things in Python all that well, I would put myself into that category by the way. I've been studying Python off and on for years, but I'm certainly not a seasoned pro at it. And it's nice to just go, okay, so yeah, that's one of the ways you could get it done and you can play around with that. Okay, so that ran the code interpreter, but let's do something a little bit more sophisticated with that, okay? Yeah, this is not available in the free version, but, uh, it, and one of the interesting things is you actually do get a file repository. It's ephemeral. It will actually be destroyed and I had that happen to me quite a few times this week. Okay. Okay, so let's go into the code interpreter and let's, let's test something. So the first thing that I would say is I got access to you some files to play around with for this presentation. And, and one of the files that I thought would be a really good exercise that is kind of mundane, nobody can be too um, opinionated about it is, you know, data sets. Let's say we're talking about weather or whatever. There's a lot of like, you know, politics inside of a data set. So I'm going to keep it really, really clean. And we're going to do work with the data set for the movie database. And specifically, I'm gonna load in a data set for the top 1,000 movies. No, sorry, 10,000 movies, okay? Yep. And you, the code interpreter will tell you, by the way, we have the question, the code interpreter will tell you it is not internet connected. And so it is not capable of running any APIs. It will tell you that, okay? The question is, will the code interpreter write APIs to connect to Kaggle? No, and this is where the file came from, Kaggle, okay? It's one of the places where you can get cool data sets to work with. So, but it will tell you actually how to build the code and you could put that into your environment. Okay, so right now it is cordoned off. Okay, so what is the demonstration that I wanna do? Well, let's actually crack this file open just so we get a chance to see what it is. It's fairly big, it's five meg, it's a five meg CSV. So that's not a small thing, okay? It's not a small thing and you can see how this is structured. Okay, so you might think, well, how is this gonna be applicable to me? Do you ever need to work procedurally on something like an Excel file or a document file? Okay, you wanna take the file and do something with it that you can describe. You wanna build graphs, you wanna manipulate the data, now, one of the things that I tried to do with the code interpreter and I quickly realized it was not well suited for it is 
you wouldn't be able to ask it go, all right, I want to have you rewrite alternative taglines for all of these entries. Now, that would be something that ChatGPT by itself would be well suited for. But the code interpreter is not well suited for authorship of new information. It is a manipulator of sorts. It will rework based on something procedurally. Okay. But it wouldn't be doing something like, all right, for each of these rows, take this and then rework it. Okay. Not well suited for this. And so you can see the data. Uh, you can see the data here that I'm capable of working with. We'll close that out. Don't save. And we'll say something to the tune of please graph the revenue of sci fi movies over the last 50 years. Here's the data to work with. Okay, now one of the things about this presentation is I couldn't preload anything because the files will get destroyed within hours. They literally will get destroyed. And I'm hoping they don't get destroyed during this presentation, the ones that I'm working with, okay? But <laughs> anything's possible, okay? So what I just did is I dragged this over and dragged a file over, okay? Now that in and of itself is super cool. And imagine all the times where you're like, I want ChatGPT to open this file. I want ChatGPT to open this file. And you're like, well, I can't do that. Okay. So this is capable. Now it's loading that in and it hasn't completed it. But usually when it, it, it fails on me, it fails pretty early. We'll give it some time. And while that's baking, ooh, failed. Okay, so, you know, I got this error message. Failed to get interpreter upload status for file. <sighs> okay, it didn't like that, huh? Didn't like that. Let's try that again. Okay, now, one of the things that I realized when I was working with this, for those of you who do have access, it doesn't like the same file names. Okay, so I'm going to upload it again. Come on. Okay, I think it took. Yeah, I think it took. And this isn't always super consistent. But right now, it's working on building some Python code. Let's watch it do its thing. So. In Python, and I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through this. There are all these libraries that you can run. Okay. Now the reality is there are super sophisticated libraries for almost every discipline. One of the nice things about Python, even if you're not a coder, is the fact that people have built really, really sophisticated libraries. And this pandas library is for data science. OK, now I wouldn't say that it's right out of the gate going to be as powerful as something like Power BI, but it is capable of working with data. OK, and so it says, hey, I'm going to load this up. And the first thing that it says is, OK, so I can read the files. And it's going to filter out the movies that are sci fi. It's going to identify those sci-fi movies over the last 50 years, group the movies, calculate the total revenue. So this is actually kind of a compound request that I made, right? Wasn't even being thoughtful about what my request was. I'm like, I think it can do it. Let's give it a try, okay? So there seems to be an issue with the release date field. The release date field is kind of messy in that data set. So it's actually going to clean that up. So one of the things that's the challenge of data scientists is cleaning up data. OK, let's say you've got really, really messy data. I have used this to clean up messy data in really powerful ways. And 
So you're kind of combining the data scientist capability with the chat GPT capability. So cleaning up the data. Now, it's not a super sophisticated bit of data to clean up, but uh, it says, all right, it seems that I forgot to set the current year. So it's correcting itself. So you notice it's iterating this. Okay, it is going through. It says show work. Okay, now I didn't get a plot. Let's see if I can extract the plot. Can you please graph? Show me the plot of that data. Oh, it's still going. So I gotta, I, what I didn't realize is it's still working. Okay. And I can see, I'm gonna move myself over on the left hand side so you can see it's working. Cross your fingers. It's entirely possible that not all of these are going to play out the first time around perfectly. This is an alpha, so it shouldn't be too surprising. So it says, hmm. Probably would have expected it to show by now. So the question that I have to, to, to figure out is, do I want to hit stop generating? Or do I want to give it time? I think I'm going to hit stop generating. And I'm going to say, can you plot that? So I kind of disrupted it pretty bad. <laughs> write a program to flip a coin. Yeah, so the question came in, uh, the Python code can recognize poorly formatted data, then fetch, it'll create a function. <sighs> All right. I always want my first demo to work just so we're clear, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and it looks like it worked, okay? Um, so, yes, it'll clean up your data and you can have it uh, you can have it do some sophisticated stuff. So that's really, really nice for any data scientist to say, man, I got some mess. Like data scientists get exports from, you know, SaaS systems. Maybe it's like Salesforce or security systems or finance systems. And then they have to, they have to spend a lot of their time perfecting the data, right? So to total revenue of sci-fi movies over the last 50 years in billions. Okay, cool. And by the way, some of these demos I have done verbatim. This demo is like, I think this is going to be the data or the demo that I'm going to do. I've done a few different things with this data set, but I wasn't really sure what it was going to look like. And uh, we can definitely see that there was a pretty big drop off uh, over one of these years, which I don't think is that surprising. Yeah, so this is pretty cool. And I mean, that was a really compound request that we did. Yep. You guys, you guys got the, the point of the dip there, right? And oh, let's say. Can I get that file so I can download it? So we could obviously take a screen grab of it, but let's let's get it from the source. <laughs> I just realized, oh, it saved it in a CSV file. Okay, so I could download that. Okay, let's let's look at that. That's not what I I, I tried to ask it, but I framed that question really poorly. I tried to ask it for the image, but that, you know, that was my mistake, right? That was my mistake. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the file. I don't know what this is going to look like. Okay, so this would be perfect. You know, give that to, give that to, and notice, what, what year did Star Wars come out? 
What year did Star Wars come out? Like 1977, right? Yeah, so probably the reason why we had the blip there. Another few blips. Okay, cool. So you guys get the, the idea there. I think that was... And... Uh, what can you give me the image of the graph as well? Okay. So as we're as we're winding down on this particular demo, here's the the caveats that I would have. And let's actually go back to the demo environment as it's working through that. The files and the code is all instantiated for this chat. It will be destroyed within 24 hours and maybe quite a bit less. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to treat it like a normal chat in ChatGPT where it persists over time. No, the code interpreter stuff becomes kind of useless after 24 hours. So get it, download it, and work with it, okay? Okay. So what's next on tap? Let's um let's spend a little bit of time on I mentioned Star Wars. There's a little bit of a theme to this webinar. Okay. So I took a screen grab of the Star Wars scroll. And we, if we have watched movies, we've probably seen this before. Now, in the movie, it's actually tilted, right? But let's use this and work with this file. So sometimes we have the need to work with files. Maybe it's not like a document file. Maybe it's a, raster, a rasterized like image, okay? So this is a ping, a PNG, but... What I'm going to show you is going to be capable of uh, being done on any kind of file. Okay, let's OCR it. Let's do optical character recognition. One of the interesting things about this particular is like it's kind of messy. It's got like stars all over the place. And I actually don't think it's perfectly suited for OCR. It's a little bit more challenging. And so let's build a new chat. So that was pretty cool. That worked really well. Let's try another example. So again, we're we're going to go in. We're going to start a new chat because that old chat has nothing to do with what I'm going to be doing now. Can you OCR this file for me? Optical character recognition. So in a way, we are asking it to read a file. So I'm going to upload that. Hopefully, yep, looks like it worked. <laughs> and James is saying we could use it to get back past captures. Okay. Really soon, AI is going to be better at captures than human beings. And my that is my fear, right? Captures are the things that separate us from bots. And okay, so the first thing is took my file, it says, yes, I can do that. And it says it extracted text from the image, but it seems like quality and clarity of that m might not be ideal. Okay. So, okay, so I didn't like that, but let's, let's analyze what it did. Okay, so it took the file and then there is this Pi Tesseract library. Okay, so that's really one of the cool things about the code interpreter is there's libraries for a lot of stuff, including artificial intelligence. This is an artificial intelligence library. Okay, now what we're gonna see is that this is the result. Okay, so that doesn't look good at all. I mean, that's not good, right? It doesn't work. 
Okay. Let's clean up that color image. And I'm going to say make it grayscale and blur it out slightly. Okay. So I'm going to try to manipulate the file in a way that's going to make it easier for the Tesseract OCR image. Now notice, it actually did it, right? So it's now grayscale. Did that procedurally. It's a little bit blurrier. And now it says, oh, there's a significant improvement over the previous attempt. <laughs> I don't know what that character is, but it does seem like it's doing a kind of decent job at OCR, okay? So it's not perfect, but the idea is you could then take the logic, take the logic from the, the things that you do here, and then for coders, they would be able to work with that, bring it into their development environment. And even for me, some of the things I've done have been networking based. It's one of my disciplines, uh, my initial discipline in, in tech was IT. And there's libraries that I had no idea that were great at working with IP addresses. And there's literally libraries that will reveal a lot of information about IP addresses, okay? So that was able to work with the image and provide kind of a halfway decent. I've done this before and I've gotten slightly better results. I've actually gotten dead on results. So I could probably just regenerate the response and probably get something better. Okay. Yeah. This And uh, CyberMonkey is saying that one of the stars is screwing up the title. There's definitely some challenge to this, but I've put it put like full receipts through this system and away you go. Kind of cool little thing. Okay. So let's kick it into another demonstration for you. Maybe run it through Dolly to clean it up. Dolly being the text to the, the text to image artificial intelligence software from OpenAI. Okay, so let's go back. Let's play around some more with this just to give you a few different perspectives. Okay. I am a tech guy, work with networking a fair amount. But imagine a time where you have your your boss wants you to do something and you're like, oh, that's going to take forever, right? Sometimes you like a really simple request from your boss. You're just like, okay, yeah, that's, that's, uh, maybe I'm not super good with Excel. Maybe I don't know how to do that. Or maybe it's beyond just rudimentary Excel things. I'm going to work with a firewall log to show you some of the, the capability of this. Let's see it. And that firewall log is opened up. This is a firewall log, not from one of my firewalls. Fortunately, people don't like sharing their firewall logs because they're kind of opening up their environment. Okay. Now let's say you aren't a tech person and you don't know what this means. Okay. I'll give you just one thing. The destination ports and the source ports and things like that, they tell us what protocol. Like when you go to a web page, you're going to see that most of the web page requests are maybe for 443 and hopefully not port 80. And then there's ports for name, resolu uh, name resolution. Port 53 is pretty well known. What if your boss is like, all right, there's something weird going on. I want you to rewrite all the destination ports to the name of the port 
protocol that it is. And you're like, well, man, like I could probably do that in Excel if I had the know-how. But let's say we don't have that know-how, right? There are wizards that can do crazy stuff with Excel, right? We're gonna work with this file. We're gonna make it a lot more human readable. Okay, even if you're not a tech person, it will become more human readable. And so let's let's use that as our use case. Please rewrite the source and destination ports in this firewall so that it is the well-known uh, protocol in name and not the numeric value. Okay. So one of the things, and even uh, this week, there have been in interesting security breaches, to say the least. One of the big ones is the move it file transfer security breach. And sometimes we're pouring over log files. We're trying to interpret what's going on. And so we're going to upload that. Good. Looks like it's going to take. Give it a moment. And it might have some questions. A lot of times when I've done this, it's going to say, hey, what do you mean by that? And it'll clarify. Very early on, it's going to make sure that it can read it. By the way, if you are working with CSV files, use UTF-8. Okay, if you're saving a file, there's just a CSV type. Like, I'm a Windows guy. But if you do UTF-8, that's a much more readable format. Just a little tip. If you're ever working with CSVs, try that one. Okay. So it's saying, hey, the well-known ports. So it's using its knowledge, right? ChatGPT has a tremendous amount of knowledge at its fingertips and is applying that. Now, I could also say, I've got a file that tells you all of the ports. And in my prep for this webinar and this event, I was like, okay, so, you know, uh, here are the well-known ports. So I could actually also upload this to amend its knowledge if I wanted to. Okay, now, and I thought I needed it. But my first time around doing this, I realized, okay, uh, it actually is good even out of the box. So it's telling me the format, but it didn't give me. And here's here's the cool thing. It rewrote some of this stuff. So now it says RDP, which is a remote desktop protocol, which means I'm allowing remote desktop protocol through my firewall. That may not be something you want to do. DNS, no big deal, okay? So it just became more human readable. And instead of me having to figure out and crack open some Excel books or have somebody else do it for me, which is really how I do it, I get to self-service my request, okay? So uh, please give me the updated firewall lock. Because just the summary view isn't going to be super useful. So I'm going to want to be able to download that to be able to work with it. And yes, this is a capability that plus subscribers are probably, I can't say if it's in weeks or months, but it's going to be this year that people are going to get access to these kinds of tools. And this is probably not the only one that they're working on. It's the only kind of, and this is kind of a sneak peek, right? So I'm going to download the file. Comes up with a nice little name for it. And now, now a person is going to be able to look these over and say, all right, so let's say I 
wanted to see if Telnet. Telnet is one of those things that we would not want to allow through our firewall. And we can say, all right, Telnet appears to be denied. It appears to be dropped. And so I could search this file. It's a lot easier to work with. And you could eyeball things. Sometimes we can miss the forest for the trees in information that we get, right? This just made it more human readable for me. I know most of these ports, but even still, I know all of the ports uh, that it's resolved so far. But I'd be like, you know, HTTP port 80, what's going on there? Okay. Now we've got some questions that are out there. Okay. Uh, AutoGPT can do similar things like this. Absolutely. Here's the deal, though. My experience with AutoGPT is it's going to be capable of this kind of level in probably a month or two. If I were doing this with AutoGPT right now, we'd probably be stuck at the first demo, and I'd probably be battling it a little bit, okay? But this, I mean, I'm working without a net here. These demonstrations are taking advantage of an alpha feature, and they they worked pretty well. I didn't have to massage it too much. I had one issue with a file upload, and and that was it, and I just worked through it, right? And it didn't do a super job at OCR, but let's say I was building software to do optical character recognition. I would then be able to take that Python information, see how it behaved, and then extend that in my own environment, okay? I'm looking at the time. Let's do one more thing. And I don't know if this is going to work. I saved this one to the end. And it's totally unprepped. <laughs> and that's the beauty of, of these demonstrations is uh, you get to see me battle. And this, you know, we're not going to break anything today because we already had what I would consider a successful demonstration of the code interpreter. But let's work with. Uh, this video file that I have now one of the one of the interesting things about Python is it is capable of doing a lot of really sophisticated things. I did ask it, hey, can you put in closed captioning in one of my previous videos I did a I'm teaching uh, a networking class and ransomware was one of the videos. This is a really short video, but it's still 32 megs long. So let's start uploading this and see if I can get it up there. This is a cross your fingers because it's larger. It's 32 mags. I absolutely don't know if it's going to work. I have uploaded 80 meg files, just so we're clear, and the cap is 100. Okay. But earlier this week, I actually thought I broke the environment because I kept on battling a larger upload my interpretation was wrong. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to go back to the slides as this is working through. We'll see if it we'll see if it bakes. Do you guys have any questions that I haven't uh, a, a lot of the questions that are out there a lot of the questions that are out there are about the plus subscription. Okay? Let me just tell you a little bit about the plus subscription. Let's say you're not looking to do anything super fancy, but you did show up to this presentation, okay? If you showed up to this presentation, you have a little bit of interest in the tech, whether you want to use it or not, okay? You just want to know what it's about. If you plan on using it, I, and I don't work for OpenAI, but all the really juicy features are being exposed to the Plus subscribers and the main thing that you get with GPT-4 or with Plus is GPT-4, which is super good and way better than what you get with the free version. So if you plan on using it any measurable amount or you just want to skill up and make sure that you're sharp, I would recommend, I think it's money well spent, 20 bucks a month. It's a little bit more than a Netflix subscription, but... It's definitely more useful, okay, if you plan on using it, okay? 
So great. <laughs> the file actually uploaded, which was problem number one. And challenge number two is what are we going to do with this? Do you got this is a like a five minute video. Do you guys have any ideas? I I have two things that I preconceived that I could do with this right now. Do you guys have any requests for seeing what we're going to do with this MP4? Yeah, 3.5, CyberMonkey is saying 3.5 is the decaffeinated version. It's kind of like the starter version. That's the way that I'd say it. Okay, get a transcript, create closed captioning. Oh, really good requests. Okay, so Dwayne, I'm going to answer... I'm going to answer Dwayne's question. It isn't going to be capable of closed captioning, and here's why. In order to do that, all closed captioning stuff is mostly done with API. And I've worked a lot with closed captioning over the last years, and a lot more this year because of AI tech. It would want to use the Whisper API, and it would immediately bork at it and say, I can't do that because I don't have internet access, so I can't use APIs. So a lot of that kind of thing isn't going to work. Okay. Yeah, um, I like, I can work with something that's really akin to Matthews, I think. Can you cut out any places in this video that are silent for more than three seconds? No idea if this is going to work, right? <laughs> Thanks for that, Mike. And zero, this is really in its environment, it's exclusively Python. In the environment, zero, to answer your question, it's exclusively Python. If you wanted to do things like Excel macros and have it write Excel macros and VB script, you would want to do that in GPT-4, just a regular thing and say, hey, can you write me an Excel macro that is going to be able to do this, okay? Can you write an Excel macro to do this? So that's how I'd answer that. I'm not an Excel macro kind of person, but I've heard and seen really good demonstrations of the GPT-4 model, which is the default thing that you get with the plus subscription. And... Yes, you would be able to you would be able to do it. Okay. So it is now writing. This is writing this out. It's probably gonna take longer than I want it to. But you can see kind of some of the interesting things. It's it's got some interesting imports. It's figuring out how to detect silence. It's taking longer than expected. The video is pretty big, but it's actually really giving it a, like an honest try, right? Give it an honest try. And if this doesn't work, we will punt on that. But this is the nature of an agent. So when people start, and you're going to start hearing about agents a lot more, maybe not this year, auto GPT, baby AGI, they're the big agents. But OpenAI doesn't want to be left behind, OpenAI being the organization that runs ChatGPT, and they are absolutely building their own agents. And let's not, let's not underestimate them, okay? So we might have to let this cook for too long, and I don't want to babysit it. Let's go back. Okay, folks, what we wanted to do today is give you some exposure to more AI tech, right? We uh, run webinars really, really frequently. If you are new to Stormwind, you don't know what we're about, we are a training company. We have 
over 250 classes. Do a lot of classes on Microsoft, Cisco, Amazon, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, project management. And if you think this environment is a good environment for you or somebody that you know needs training or has an interest in training, check us out. We have a large catalog and that catalog is actually growing. We've gone and we're, we're doing some really rapid development. If you do want a contact to get to know what our offering is about, take a look at Mike Fajan. His contact information is on screen. He's one of our enterprise sales reps, one of the top reps. And you can also go to stormwindstudios.com. If you don't know what classes are available, you can poke around there. Take a look at the classes. There's a lot of classes to choose from. And hopefully we get an opportunity to see you in one of our classes. But we are officially out of time. So with that, hopefully you had some fun today. I absolutely did. And got some interest exposure in new artificial intelligence technologies. I really appreciate all the the fun interaction that you folks bring, uh, definitely a lot of familiar names and faces, but some new names and uh, faces as well. I can't see you, it's one-sided, right? Okay, but without further ado, let's hermetically seal the presentation. Thanks folks for attending and hope you do come and join us at Stormwind Studios.